So, good evening. Uh, this is Film Animation History and Theory, week two. Well, the thing that I always dreaded would uh, happen has happened, and I'm here I am giving a lecture to myself. So, it's a novel, a novel thing, I've got to say. But we're going to press on regardless. Hopefully some people will join me, um, and that'll be great. So, and yes, we have people. We've got Steph. How are you, Steph? I was busy giving a, uh, a lecture to myself. Um, so I'm just going to keep, keep on because I'm recording. Um, so it's just you and I at this stage. Hopefully some more other people will, will join us so, and they can, they can watch the recording, which would be great. So um, last week uh, we, uh, we looked at uh, bridging the gap between Victorian optical toys, the birth of cinema, um, and the emerging uh, animation film industry. Great, we've got some people, that's excellent. Um, and so this slide is particularly poignant because I was uh, about to give a lecture to myself. Um, and one of the things I just wanted to say, um, and I've sort of thought about this quite a bit um, uh, recently, that quite often I, uh, I find myself uh, kind of just sitting here talking to myself and it just feels a little not very interactive um you know so you know if if um if you want to you know, make comments and whatnot uh interact that's always good and you can engage in lots and lots of different ways you can engage on the discussion forum um you can engage on the facebook group you can you can just chip in it's always good always good to to hear what contributions you have because it just makes it as i say as the slide says it makes it much more funner when there's when there's when there's more of us uh discussing things cool okay so um in the notes i've given you a link to uh kahoot um now, I'm going to have a bit of a, uh, an experiment um, this evening. Hopefully it will work. I've been toying with this idea for uh, most of the year, and I thought I'd, I'd give, it a, give it a go. Kahoot's just an app. You can get it from the App Store. Um, I've seen it in use uh, a number of times in the classroom. And basically, you know, we can, we can do things like we can have a, a quiz and we can sort of have sort of, some interactive interactivity later on um, so if, if in the background you want to uh, get that and it will make a lot more sense when we get there so if, if in the meantime you can you can uh, go and get Kahoot that'd be great so last week we introduced the first brief which is two week three um, now in here I'm saying uh, it's a timeline of animation history that's a complete mistake that's left over from um, the, the, the last brief. As we discussed last week, it's going to be a uh, work in progress of, of, your, of a much bigger uh, presentation. So it's no longer a timeline. So I should have scrubbed that out. I only see my mistakes when I'm actually uh, presenting. So um, last week we uh, discussed the first storytellers. Uh, we you know, looked at how you know, human beings have been telling sequential um, stories since the dawn of time. Everything from rock art, epic Roman tales, William the Conqueror and the Bayer Tapestry, shadow plays, every culture has had storytelling um, at its very heart. Um, then we looked at this thing called the persistence of vision, which was uh, given its name and, and sort of a formal study recognized by uh, 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 Peter Roger, 1824. Um, and essentially, it's the idea that the eye is slightly quicker than the brain and you get this after image and the brain has the ability to essentially join all of those little after images together. And therefore, you get the illusion of, of movement. In actual fact, you're seeing uh, a, a, a sequence of still images um, and it's a complete trick of the eye, persistence of vision. Then we uh, discussed Edward Mybridge's studies of motion. He wasn't making film, 
he, he, he was literally wanted to photograph uh, animals in motion so that he could make sense of, of how animals moved and human beings moved. Um, and then we went, you know, we, we, we uh, looked at uh, Emile Reynold and we had lots of unpronounced pronounceable French uh, words which I stumbled over. The theatre um, uh, optique, which was you know, cited as being the, the world's first um, uh, performance, if you will, of moving images. Um, sometime after, a couple of years after, the Lumiere brothers um, presented their, uh, their, 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 their short films. And often the Lumiere brothers are cited as giving the first performance of uh, motion to an audience, to a paying audience. But it was actually Emile Radon that um, uh, has that honor of presenting uh, moving images to a theater. We looked at things like uh, the, the first VFX shot, uh, the beheading of Mary Queen of Scots, 1895. Um, and then we uh, looked a little bit at uh, Georges Milot uh, and his uh, surreal films and the bizarre um, stories that he told. And he, he made um, uh, numerous, I think it's something like 500 short films. And he really is the, the, the father of, of modern cinema and, and visual effects. So, on we go. So this week, we're going to take you a little bit deeper into the and set the groundwork for um, uh, the um, uh, history of animation. Um, we're going to talk about it's pretty there's, there's lots of little landmarks. So it's kind of hard to pinpoint the, the major ones and sort of sift out. But over the next few weeks, we're going to we're going to discuss uh, some of those those little land, landmarks. And I think Little Little Nemo is in 1911, which was uh, the work of ca a cartoonist, and he was quite a, a celebrated uh, newspaper cartoonist, William Winsor Mackay. And he, you know, had quite a lot of notoriety and uh, um, and success before this moment. But you know, as he was seeing this new technology evolved this idea of moving images he thought wouldn't it be great to see if i can make my um my cartoons come come alive so it's quite an ambitious project um because little nemo uh, and slumberland was a well-established um and quite a sophisticated um cartoon series um and to bring that alive uh bring that to life using this emerging animation uh, medium was 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 incredible, really. Um, so that happened in 1911, and it's and if you and there's links down there. You really should go and watch it. I won't show them to you in class because I think it, it gives you something to do in your own time. But I think it's probably more valuable to do it in your own time. Plus, I can uh, actually post this on uh, on YouTube if I record those videos within. It doesn't allow me to post my lectures, which is a little annoying. Um, but they 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 were quite they were quite advanced in their um, their in their narrative. Um, the this period of time there was a you know really quite an appetite for surrealist uh, storytelling, um, and Little Nemo is a is just a fantastic example of that. Um, I've no idea whether they were just influenced by some of the kind of crazy drugs that were quite common at the time. Like they're all sort of smoking, you know, uh, various things and uh, taking, you know, various substances, but which, which was sort of quite normal back then. Um, and maybe it spilled out in, in some of the uh, artistic expression. Um, who knows? Not too sure. But um, you should go and check out Little Nemo because it, it's, it's quite amazing. Um, a little while later, um, Winsor, in 1914, Winsor Mackay uh, came up with a, another piece of animation. And this is even in some ways more bizarre, because if you think about it, 
film was a new medium and it hadn't quite established itself. It was still considered very much a novelty and people didn't really know where it was going. There was, there was uh, not really such a thing as a, a feature length film at this stage. Um, and, you know, you know, entertainment up until this point was very much um, uh, sort of centered around some of the traditional theater and in particular vaudeville theater which was essentially just variety, short variety acts. Um, and that was considered uh, what entertainment was. And Mackay decided to take his, uh, his animation and see what it would translate in the theater. So he did this really interesting and quite a, a brave experiment was that he animated this dinosaur and he appeared live on stage with this dinosaur. Uh, it was Gertie the dinosaur. And what, what he did was he obviously knew what the timings were going to be. And he, he would say, oh, come on, Gertie, come on, step out from the screen. And you know, Gertie would walk out, you know, from um, behind the curtain. And people were amazed because they really thought he was talking to this drawing. They were really quite uh, taken. Uh, by this medium, and of course, you know, it was all choreographed, and he'd say, okay, Gertie, you know, um, uh, move to the left, come over here, and Gertie would move across, and it was, it was quite bizarre. And people were actually quite terrified of this thing, because you think, you know, they've got on this great big screen, they're sort of seeing this, this dinosaur, even though the, the drawings were, were just rudimentary line drawings, not very good, and the animation wasn't, wasn't great either. Um, but people were completely taken in and mesmerized by this theatrical trick. Um, and there's some, there's some great footage of that there in the, in the, in the link. So you should go and have a, have a little look at that. His next project uh, came about in 1918, which was sort of at the, the, sort of the, the last year of the First World War. And it was quite a, an, uh, an incredible um, uh, uh, project. And what had happened, uh, there was a, a British uh, passenger ship that was traveling between New York and the UK. And uh, this, this passenger ship was sunk by a German submarine. And it was this um, phenomenal, uh, act of, of aggression um, on a sort of scale that was unimaginable and this all happened in the middle of the night and uh, this uh, passenger boat went down ship went down and it wasn't recorded at all um, the only people that saw it were the people that were fortunate enough to get into a lifeboat but a lot of people died and it was, it was kind of the equivalent of the 9-11 um, terrorist attack in New York. It was, it was on that scale. And, and interestingly enough, when we, when we think of that, we, there was so much footage, you know, everyone had a mobile phone, there's so much footage of that. The thing is about the Lusitania, it was on that scale and, and, but there was, there was not one recorded image. It was in the middle of the night, photography wasn't that good, um, and the thing in the boat just went down. And the only way people knew about it was through some drawings that were made uh, and printed in newspapers several days later. Um, and what Mackay did was he was, he was so, um, I guess, motivated by this, he decided to turn it into uh, uh, an animated film. And of course, animation is incredibly time consuming. And this, this project, um, you know, this happened in 1915 and it took him until 1918 to complete it. And this, the making of this, 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 this act, um, this event, um, 
went a long way to bringing America into the First World War and, and changing opinion. That's what media does. That's what, you know, any kind of uh, uh, media does is it changes opinion. And so that's why this is quite an important piece of animation. Um, it was quite an epic, 12 minutes, was considered the, uh, the longest work of animation at its time of release. Um, and Mackay was considered the, the greatest animation filmmaker of his generation. And you know, animation was, was an emerging art form. There weren't too many people uh, doing it at the time and he was certainly the greatest exponent of that. Like I said, there was lot, there's lots of other um, moments in the history of animation which I'll cover in, in coming weeks. Um, but this was, uh, in my mind, probably one of the most epic um, and important pieces of animation. And you should really go and watch, the link's there, and you should go and, go and watch it because it's, it's, it's actually really inventive. Um, and yeah, it's, it, there, there's, some, there's some beautiful drawings in this thing. And you know, they're animating smoke and fire and the whole thing, the act of a boat with a ship being sunk by a torpedo really beautifully visualized so it's uh, it's an important piece of work you should absolutely familiarize familiarize yourself with it um so i'll leave that there for you to to go and look at okay so the period between you know the emerging film industry up until this sort of 1910 ish there's lots of people dabbling with um filmmaking but the, the the techniques were really crude. The technology wasn't that crash hot, um, and it you know people were still thought of it as being a bit of a novelty. It was like oh, this this you know the moving pictures that will never catch on. But from about 1910 to about 1920, that was the moment when uh, films actually became mainstream and became actually just quite quite big business i'm reading uh, the biography of buster keaton at the moment and i was i was actually really kind of quite surprised by the kinds of money that was being made by um movie stars and and, and film companies at the time um at one stage that's uh, when buster keaton made his his first films and he was he was he, he was making these these what he called two reelers which are just short um uh movies that were uh, he made with uh fatty arbuckle the guy at the, on the dressed as a cowboy at the top and the, the, the pair of them were comic geniuses and um he was getting paid a thousand dollars a week in 1920, that would have been a phenomenal amount of money, like unimaginable. Um, and so you can, like it gives you some sort of perspective of, of, of that era. Charlie Chaplin was uh, one of the richest uh, people in America um, in 1920. He, he already had a, a really, really successful uh, film career and, uh, you know, had, was was heavily invested in in film companies, um, but essentially, the, the the movie industry was taking over from vaudeville entertainment. Vaudeville entertainment was you know very much um, mainstream working class entertainment. It, you know, it wasn't uh, going to the theatre. It wasn't going to the ballet. It wasn't going to the opera. It was these crazy little um uh shows variety shows and it was in, you know people in, in massive demand people went to the to the theaters and, and they were traveling vaudeville acts all over europe all over the states and between 1910 and 1920 that's when the film industry came in and had started uh taking over from vaudeville and there's lots of sort of stories, anecdotes of uh, these vaudevillians when they were saying, oh, the movie industry is it's never going to take off. It's, it's never going to, it's never going to happen. And it was only when Buster Keaton's vaudeville career was taking a bit of a plunge and people were 
sort of thinking, oh yeah, he's he's, he's kind of his. He was in a, a family act with his father, and his uh, the act was sort of going downhill, and his father became a bit of an alcoholic, and um, you know they weren't getting as many of the crowds in. He thought, oh, what what shall I do? What, you know, my, I'm all washed up. What I'm going to do? And that's when he thought he would dabble with this new filmmaking thing, you know, and, and everyone was like, oh, my God, it's, his career is really bottomed out. And he's, you know, he's turned away from uh, the film industry and he's now, he's turned away from the, the stage industry and he's now so desperate he's making films. And almost overnight he started making more money than he could ever imagine. So why this is important with animation is because it's it's intricately linked um, because animation and the silent film era and the silent era film era really goes from 1895 uh, to 1927 where sound comes in and there's there's all these little parallels and, and, and important uh, pieces of history that we need to cover off just to give us perspective. Um, so this period saw lots of technological advancements in filmmaking, which I talk about, which, which you know, things like sound and color and different things coming in. Um, and more importantly, the, you know, the introduction of a thing called the feature film. Up until this point, um, films were really, really short. So they had to have, you know, several of them bundled together because you wouldn't, pay to go into a movie theatre just to see a six minute film. So this idea of getting people and having a full uh, uh, entertainment experience was, was quite important. And also the thing about these guys is they were used to performing live. So their skill level is phenomenal. Um, I've recently been watching some of uh, the Buster Keaton and Fatty Arbuckle films, the collaborations they made. And the skill level of, of their performances is, is mind-blowing that we take all this stuff for granted. But you remember, a lot of this stuff was done in single takes. They did their own stunts. Um, and, you know, I, I just don't think we, we, we've sort of lost that craft. They, they, craft they, they had that craft that came from uh, performing live. But also, I've started to, be, be, to be, really be able to see from looking at those those uh, those comedies they made, um, you know Laurel and Hardy, Chaplin, Harold Lloyd, Buster Keaton, Fatty Arbuckle, and seeing a lot of the the the, the kind of comedy which started spilling into animation in the nineteen twenties and the 1930s and 40s. You can really see, you know, we'll talk about people like uh, Tex Avery and all of those Warner Brothers shorts. You can really see a link to the, the slapstick um, comedic moments that were coming out of the, um, uh, these silent films which came from vaudeville. So I really encourage you to go and uh, look at some of these films and, you know, Buster Keaton, Fantastic. It's just, in my mind, just the master. And it's kind of, um, if you're going to be an animator or interested in making film at all, you really need to go and familiarise yourself with this stuff. And it's quite the treat to uh, go back and, 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 and look at silent movies from an academic perspective. I think it's, it's really important. Um, okay. Lose my voice. So, during the ninth, you know, that period, 1910 to 1920, we're starting to see this idea of, of film stars, you know, people that were, um, you know, quite well-known, uh, drawing a crowd, um, appearing on posters, people that were, um, you know, well-regarded within the industry as being stars. And they had this idea of, you know, animation was starting to evolve. And I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great to have an animated movie star, Felix the Cat, the world's first animated movie star. And this idea that he was a, a personality and a celebrity and would uh, gain a reputation and draw a crowd 
and basically put people in the cinema. So it's quite a quite a, uh, uh, a, a big leap in many ways. So Felix was an anthropomorphic uh, cartoon character, basically um, based on some of the uh, the antics of people like Chaplin. So that, that's how they saw him as this 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 cartoon sort of sort of uh, comedic character. Um, uh, and again, I'd, I'd, I would urge you to go and um, look at some of these early Felix the Cat films. We think of cartoons as being for kids. Um, and you look at the early Felix the Cat films and they're really dark. They're really surreal. They're weird. They're gritty. Um, they're violent. Um, there's... Refer drug references, um, the, they're really bizarre um, and not at all how we think of, of, of as cartoon characters. This stuff really wasn't meant to be children's entertainment. Um, they were referencing um, things from um, uh, cabaret uh, clubs like the Cotton Club, which were quite quite out there. You know, there was a high level of um, sexuality and it was just it was just really risky kind of adult entertainment. I, mean, I, think, I think the 1920s are, is a fascinating era for lots of reasons and I often ask you to in your essays to refer to uh, things that were happening around the same time as the the material you're writing about, so understanding the socio political economic um, uh, fa side factors can be massively influential and if you think about what was happening in the 1920s um, it was uh, post war we, they'd they'd seen um, uh, uh, a world war on an industrial scale. Um, they'd never seen uh, the destruction of, of 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 human beings in quite that same way. So they would have been highly traumatized and quite um, uh, quite rattled by that whole experience. You know, the world was changing, and also. They wanted to put that, that experience behind them. So all of the experiences that led them up to the war, they wanted to distance themselves for, which, from, which is kind of gave us the birth of, of modernism. And so the 1920s was a really interesting period. They rejected everything that had come before. Um, there was all of that very, um, you know, those Victorian... Uh, puritanical values that they absolutely moved away from. Um, really interesting times. So the 1920s were quite debauched and um, yeah. And I, th and I think you really see it in a lot of the filmmaking. You certainly see it in the animation. There's a lot of references to things that you think, wow, what was, what was going on then? Um, Felix the Cat, really important. Uh, interestingly enough, there's an Australian connection. Uh, Felix the Cat was uh, drawn and invented by uh, an Australian-American cartoonist called Pat Sullivan. Uh, this has been dis slightly disputed by, uh, by somebody, but you can sort of go into uh, looking at that just to, you know, um, from a, uh, an academic perspective, you need to uh, sort of mention that, that there is some reference that maybe this isn't quite true, but who, who knows, I don't know. But most of the evidence I can see is that uh, Pat Sullivan uh, was, was uh, credited as being the uh, uh, creator of, um, of, of Felix the Cat. He's certainly, certainly uh, credited in the film, so who, who can know? Uh, and you've seen this, this image here, there's sort of some sort of crossover between Felix the Cat and Chaplin here. So imagine Chaplin was the was a massive film star at this point. 
you know, one of the, uh, the highest grossing, highest paid uh, people in the film industry. And Felix the Cat is kind of trying to have a part of that. Um, yeah, interesting. Okay, moving on slightly, and the techniques are changing. Um, the, there's, they're getting more advanced. Uh, the film industry is is really gaining a pace, and the, and, 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 and the technology is coming on in leaps and bounds. Um, we discussed that in VFX pipeline. We looked at some of those uh, advancements. So, in 1921. Out of the Inkwell was a, a series that was um, established and founded by two brothers, Max and Dave Fleischer, who then eventually um, set up the, what was known as the, 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 the Fleischer Company, this idea of out of the Inkwell, that the ink is kind of alive and coming on the page and, and becoming alive. And it was, they were really intrigued by that notion. Um, and Fleischer Studios became the major film animation uh, production house in the world at that time. Um, and, you know, Disney was really just finding his feet and, and, and was, really wasn't at that stage yet. But Disney was kind of just um, had a few other projects on the go that really hadn't evolved yet. So Fleischer's were the main company and they're one of the, the greatest innovators of, of film animation for lots of reasons. They, they innovated a lot of techniques um, at, during the 1920s. They uh, developed a whole range of characters, Coco the Clown, Betty Boo, uh, Bimbo, Popeye the Sailor, Superman. Uh, Superman came a little bit later. Um, and their cartoons, they were, they were, they were they were really the pioneering or the premier um, animation company uh, in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and, and, and Disney started producing stuff in the mid 20s, but it hadn't really made a name for themselves until 1928, which I'll talk about in a second. But their cartoons were very, very different from the output of Disney. Um, I know. Steph's there. I know she's a big Disney fan. We've had this conversation about why I maybe my issues with Disney is for me they're quite they're very family friendly and you know there's this sort of sickly sentimental thing. Whereas the Fleischer Studios, so Disney was out in, in a, out in out in the West in California with you know Hollywood emerging as a town um, and. Uh, the Fleischers were in the East. They, you know, they came out of New York. So they had that tough New York, gritty, urban feel. Um, that there, there was all of that sort of kind of dark surrealism, adult humor, adult psychology, a lot of um, uh, uh, sort of eroticism and sexuality in their themes. Um, really, you know, things that you know themes that were a little bit in, in many ways quite realistic um a lot of and they also sort of came out of a lot of that european um uh, uh sort of uh art movements that were you know quite 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 black in their in their in their output um so essentially the Fleischers were all on the east coast and Disney was all sort of bright and sunshiny on the west coast and there's a very very different uh, mindsets. Fleischers were a lot more established and Disney was kind of just finding his feet. Um, Betty Boop. Betty Boop was uh, developed, a character developed by um, the Fleischer Studio, and um, interestingly, she was this this character that was essentially a hybrid of three people. She was a hybrid of the singer 
Helen Kane, who sung a, uh, a popular hit at the time called I Wanna Be Loved By You, which you, you'll recognize as being a Betty Boop song. There was an actress called Clara Bow. So there was a little bit of uh, Clara Bow's um, uh, influence in there. And there was also uh, a cabaret singer called, uh, she's an Afri African-American uh, cabaret singer from the Cotton Club. Um, she was an, a dancer and an entertainer and was sort of, you know, kind of the Cotton Club was a really edgy sort of place. Um, and so Betty Boop was a hybrid of all three. So Betty Boop, when she was in her first version, was uh, very much based on Baby Esther Jones. And eventually, for some reason, I don't know exactly what was going on there, but they sort of kind of whitened her up, probably more palatable for a sort of a, an Anglo taste at that time, I don't know. Um, and yeah, so there's, a, there's some interesting stuff going on with um, uh, the development of Betty Boop. And all three of these uh, uh, performers went at, at different stages and uh, took Fleischer Studios to, to, uh, to court over copyright. Um, uh, and I don't know how successful any of them were, but um, yeah, there was this, uh, this idea that they were, they all felt that uh, Betty Boop was based on, on, on them. Another um, interesting aspect to this was, there was another um, cotton club performer, jazz legend, Cab Calloway. And um, there was uh, this, this fantastic uh, pieces of animation where they literally based the animation on the performance of Cab Calloway. Cab Calloway um, was, again, like, what, what an era. I mean, look at how this guy is dressed. It's, it's, it's really quite extreme. When you see, um, I'm sort of dancing around a little bit, but I'll, I'll, you know, go and see, there's some links there to Betty the Boop, Minnie the Moocher. You need to watch that. And there's a fantastic piece of animation. I think it's the, the, um, the, the one piece of animation that really sums up this era. And it's called St. James Infirmary Blues. Again, it's this really bizarre story. And uh, you've got this character that's based on Cab Calloway. In fact, they, they rotoscoped, which is essentially uh, tracing over the, the live action stills and Fleischer Studios innovated that technology. They innovated a lot of technology. Um, and that was one of the first pieces of technology they innovated. They literally got Cab Calloway doing his, his routine um, and they animated a character over the top of him. Um, in fact, this, I think if you, uh, I'll jump forward a little bit. There was um, one of the characters, uh, Coco the Clown, um, does this Cab Calloway trademark dance. And you can absolutely see a connection between Michael Jackson's Moonwalk uh, and Cab Calloway and the rotoscoping for the cut for the cartoon clown absolutely comes from this. Um, so I was dancing around a little bit. Um, you can also see uh, some similarity between Cab Calloway and in his what he called his zoot suit, this kind of very um, ostentatious, over the top, cartoony kind of oversized sort of get up that he was wearing, and Tex Avery's wolf character from the 1930s. So there's all these lovely little connections that you'll see. Um, the 1920s was very much, we think of as being what is known as the rubber hose style of animation. Um, 
which was this really kind of loose and bendy style. A lot of the volumes in, in the characters would, would squat, squash and stretch. So they were developing some of those animation techniques for the first time. It didn't exist before these guys started playing around with it. There was, uh, I think, a reference, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit, going back to this uh, Bill Nolan, uh, the, who is credited as being the, 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 the person who invented this rubber hose animation style. He was animating Felix the Cat with Pat Sullivan. Um, uh, so yeah, the rubber hose animation style um, and rotoscoping of, of Cab Calloway. Um, Disney, the, the, the version of uh, Snow White uh, that was originally produced in 1937 was uh, effectively a German fairy tale by the Brothers Grimm and it was quite a dark, surreal thing. But um, the original version was featured Betty Boop and it was in 1933. We always think of Snow White as being a, um, uh, the, the, as, as, as the landmark uh, Disney feature film in 1937. But in actual fact, um, what we see is people, ideas being borrowed and evolved from uh, all the way through, which is, which is really interesting, I think, that ideas were a lot more fluid between uh, um, creatives at this time. So essentially, uh, Fleischer's made this version of uh, the uh, Brothers Grimm fairy tale. It was written about 100 years prior to this, and that they, they picked up this kind of this crazy idea of this German folk tale and animated it with their developed characters. So they were casting characters like you would cast um, uh, film, film stars and um, putting them in, in, these, in, in, in these productions. Um, so the original Snow White was really quite out there. So again, I would urge you to go and, and watch that during the week. So I've given you lots of homework. There's not, I'm not being lazy by not showing you footage. There's a, there's a couple of reasons why I don't show you too much footage in the classes. And it's, it's, uh, it's so that you can, you can get the slides yourself and you can, you can go on a bit of a, uh, a discovery or you know, a rediscovery of, of, of this stuff and, in, and, in, and you know, take it in at your own pace. And so all of the links are there. So, we've talked about um, the 1920s as this, this era of extreme decadence, um, surmising that uh, some of the, um, the uh, ways that people were responding to things may well have been influenced by their experience of the First World War and the horror of, of all of that. Um, but um, in the 90, early 1930s, there came this thing called the Hayes Code, which was this sort of, this code that was um, enforcing a lot uh, of more uh, uh, sort of moralistic kind of uh, controls over some of the content, which was interesting because you've got, you know, the uh, 1929, uh, the stock market crash, and there was also prohibition. So there were some moves by uh, some of the lawmakers to tone things down. They thought the 1920s had gotten completely uh, out of hand. Um, I, I watched The Great Gatsby the other day for the first time in a while and I was reminded of this period of kind of how out of control people were and they sort of almost had so much affluence they and and the, the you know they, they you know, used to sort of 
thought nothing of getting completely out of their minds and driving their cars like crazily around everywhere um, and you know, abusing alcohol. You know, there weren't sufficient um, laws in place around drug control. So things were quite crazy. At the end of the 20s, there were a number of um, sort of laws that came in to sort of try and sort of, sort of calm things down. And one of those was the Hayes Code, which was all about um, some, some, some moderation in um, content of film. Um, now, what Betty Boop was a highly sexualized um, cabaret performer. And essentially that was, that was the thing, that was her appeal, that was what she did. Um, and in fact, a lot of the, uh, the Fleischer's output was, was based on that sensibility. And all of a sudden the Hayes Code came in and they had to uh, moderate their, their, uh, a lot of their, their, um, their film output, um, which went some way to giving Disney a bit of a, com uh, a commercial competitive edge because Disney was all about that family values and, and, and um, much more kind of uh, a cleaner um, kind of family value type um, ethic. In fact, there, there's some really interesting stuff if you go and look at the f very first Mickey Mouse film, which wasn't Steamboat Willie. We, Steamboat Willie was the third one, but the first one that was made has has Mickey Mouse kind of smoking cigars and drinking beer and getting drunk and carrying on. And by the third film, which we'll talk about in a second, Steamboat Willie, he'd completely cleaned up his act and had kind of gone through a bit of a rebrand. Right. So this is an interesting sort of landmark that in 1928, uh, Buster Keaton made one of the last um, movies of the silent era. The silent era ended in 1927 because in, uh, in 1927, the jazz singer came out. Uh, the jazz singer uh, had uh, starred a guy called Al Jolson. Um, who you know, you know it's 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 terrible, really. But it's you know, there's Al Jolson made a whole career out of blackface. Um, you know that that type of racism and um, behaviour is unthinkable now, but it was considered just normal. It was so normalised then, uh, and our, our, all of all of the attitudes around there were completely out of line with what we consider um, normal and acceptable uh, social behavior then. But anyway, the important thing is 1927, sound came in, Al Jolson started, started a film called The Jazz Singer and The Jazz Singer changed everything. So that, silent film era and a lot of the um the uh big film stars like chaplin keaton didn't really do much after after the end of the silent film era chaplin's career didn't really take off much beyond that um uh the uh, laurel and hardy there's some there's some weird thing that the silent uh, film stars didn't translate into sound, and so there was this film called Steamboat Bill. It was a feature length uh, silent movie starring Buster Keaton, and ironically, the story itself represents the end of one era and the start of another. And if you if you can be bothered to go back and, and, and watch Steamboat Bill, you'll see it's this guy that's got the steamboat and there's this other guy comes in with a modern boat and sort of ruins his career. And it's kind of, there's this lovely kind of um, sort of uh, synchronicity about how uh, a change of technology um, 
ends one era and starts another, which is sort of echoed in the film, but it's also echoed in the making of the film. There's this idea that, you know, it was actually, you know, his, his last big feature. Um, and it was sort of like that idea of art uh, imitates life. So, Steamboat Bill was the, uh, the film that um, Disney came along. Disney saw The Jazz Singer, 1927, which was the first you know, film with synchronized sound. Disney was trying to get up his idea of this animated character. Uh, he'd, he'd made two previous um, short little films with Mickey Mouse, and they hadn't really done anything. They, he'd made these films, and they went to screen tests, and audience really didn't kind of like his work, and so they, he didn't release them, not, not initially. So... Steamboat Willie was the, the third film that Disney made, but it was the first one he released. So Steamboat Willie was based on uh, Steamboat Bill. And kind of ironically, whilst this was the last silent film to be made, this was the, f it's cited as being the first animated film with sound and it was the breakthrough moment for Disney it was the breakthrough moment for his character Mickey Mouse um, and from there on everything changed it was this you know kind of a watershed shed moment and that's why I mention it it's 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 an important landmark to to, to know so it was the first cartoon character to fully uh, have post-produced soundtrack which distinguished it from everything else that had happened before then. Whew. Okay, so for those that came in a little late, um, right at the beginning, I would, had asked you to download a, uh, uh, a piece of software called, or an, an app called Kahoot. So hopefully that's happened. I haven't had a, chat, a chance to chat to anyone yet because I, because, um, quite a few people arrived late. So um, can I just get a sense of how many people might have been able to get that uh, app on their phones? Might just pause. Yeah, this is the first I'm hearing of it. I might just um, pause. It's all right, you're not alone there. Is that Hunter? Yeah. Hey, hey gang. Um, <laughs> I might just pause the recording for a sec. We're resuming recording if you're watching the recording you've missed the fun kahoot game but you can click on the link and play with yourself i guess um i don't know <laughs> oh i must be tired <laughs> so um Really and truly, just just to recap, all all that was about. And I know I know I know it's just throwing lots of facts at you, um, but there's lots of links in there just to sort of bring you up to speed. You know, we've we've essentially we've come at like last week is all about Victorian toys and you know persistence of vision and you know, how animation works, how film works, um, and now we've got the start of animation start of the, the film industry which kind of kicked off it from about 1910 to about 1920 it's sort of it was this weird little kind of thing is it is it is it a thing and it sort of kind of came out of nowhere and all of a sudden it was massive huge money being made film stars making obscene amounts of money through the 1920s um, the film industry proper kicked off. Do you know Hollywood didn't even exist as a, it was like a, like LA was a, just a, just a dirty, like dusty little kind of country town. It didn't, there was nothing really there. There was no reason to be there. Hollywood was a, a, a sort of a weird suburb. 
it, you know, the Hollywood sign was a real estate sign. Um, and it was only in the 1920s, the film industry moved there really because the technology required there to be light. Um, because they didn't have the ability to film inside. So when you see any of those, those silent films, even the ones that appear to be in houses, they have sets that are, that are basically set outside with, you know, using sunlight. And they really went to LA because um, of the consistent light. It was the, it was the, it was the, it was the, con uh, the lighting conditions. And it just we went, oh, well, because, you know, we can't have a film industry on the East Coast because the weather wasn't good enough. Um, so that's why the film industry started off in California. Um, California was considered, you know, um, a very, it was an agricultural place. You know, it's where people sort of grew oranges. They didn't, like the rest of America didn't really sort of take California seriously. And it was only the, the advent of the film industry between 1910, 1920. Um, and it's just a quirk of fate that the technology required there need to be, you know, uh, sun, sunlight unlimited sunlight so that's why it was there and as soon as the technology changed when they and that's coming up in future weeks um that uh yeah and so interesting where was i going with that um <laughs> i can't remember i got a little excited um yeah so it's like that the evolution of the fleischer studio in the in the east where it was all kind of those kind of grittier kind of narratives much more sort of uh less family friendly um and probably represented the culture um of of i'm surmising here that you know that, you know life in new york was very different from life in, in la life in la was a little squeakier cleaner um yeah uh, where else was going? So, so yeah, just taking you through through, through uh, the the start of the film industry and the nineteen twenties when the film industry was you know the film industry proper and massive evolution. Mostly, a lot of those those innovations were being made by um, uh, the Fleischer Studio. So. You know, they invented so many um, pieces of technology that I'm going to cover in, in, in coming weeks. Um, so next week, I think we get into uh, the, the, the golden age of animation, um, which really kicks off from Steamboat Willie. So Steamboat Willie is a, a good landmark to get to. And how do we get, get to Steamboat, Steamboat Willie? We got really there from, you know, Gertie the Dinosaur, um, through to Steamboat Willie, really not very long. You know, it's, it's you know, in no time at all. Um, so yeah, I find it fascinating. And so it's just, I think it's just good to sort of uh, inform your knowledge of this stuff, if you didn't know it before, how we got to where we, where we are now. And I, I find it interesting that we're sort of seeing technological changes that are evolving now um, that I think are really important. I think we're at a really interesting crossroads in, in history um, that in, in 2020 is going to be cited as the, the year that VR and XR really takes off. And you guys are at a really exciting time. One of the things that really excited me about writing this course was, was that hopefully we're going to be able to, you know, be teaching students at a, a really critical moment in history. Because we, we look at this, this stuff of happening in the 1920s and, you know, evolving technology and i've been sort of around long enough to sort of see various technological changes you know sort of you know the world becoming digital and um you know uh, a, a much more connected kind of world and i think that's changing significantly um 
So yeah, I, that's all I get really excited about is about ideas and, and the application of, um, of technologies and where, and where all that's headed. So anyway, what are your thoughts? Going back to my slide here. Can you be more specific? <laughs> think of something to say. <laughs> Can't think of anything to say. <laughs> I'm annoyed that I missed the first like 10 minutes. I, I missed that thing on the dinosaur. And... Gertie the dinosaur. Well, look, you haven't really because really I was just curating a bunch of slides with some information um, for you to go and go on a bit of a... Uh, uh, a bit of a self-discovery thing yourself. Like I said, I can I can show this stuff, but you know, I think very much um, you know, it's it's different if we were in class together and we we can show stuff and discuss, which is which is obviously great. But um, yeah, it, it's it's sort of I don't know. It, it it always feels weird when I show stuff in screen. So I don't know how how good your internet connections are and I, you know, it can get a bit glitchy. I don't know. You, I, I'd love your feedback. I mean, I'm happy to show stuff in class and, and discuss it, but yeah. What if, what if you just pasted the link in the message and then in class we just all click on it and watch it at the same time and then we can come back and then talk about it. Would that work? Yeah. Yeah, that's been mentioned before. All right. I'll try that try that i think this is good as well i mean it'd be much of a muchness for me personally but i see i see it sort of uh the class just sort of being something that you can you can take my notes um and yeah obviously you know being able to discuss stuff in class is great um yeah and next week's better because we we get into you know Look, I've got so much material. I'd love to show you all the Buster Keaton stuff and the, the films he made with Fatty Arbuckle. And, um, but they are quite long. <laughs> you know, uh, but the golden age of animation is there's lots of little, little really great little nuggets of stuff. But I, 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 what I did in pre previous classes, I recorded it. And then when I put my recording up on YouTube. YouTube won't let you see it because it's got copyrighted material. Mm. And it's really annoying, which is funny really, because it's material from YouTube in my lecture being played on YouTube and YouTube won't let me play it. So <laughs> it's kind of weird. I don't know. But yeah, um, it, it, it sort of means I've got to go back back through and edit my my, uh, my videos and it's it's really annoying to to do that because it takes me ages um, so that's why you're just putting links is that right yeah so when we do it when we do, if i do ever show you videos i'll just pause i'll pause the recording while we watch stuff in class because when i if say i had a if i play you a film in this YouTube picks it up, mm. and it, and it, then it won't it won't allow you to it blocks my video. Damn it! <laughs> really annoying. Really yeah, annoying. that's. Which I understand, like copyright's important, but um, yeah, it's sort of got it's kind of gone mad. But cool. Um, all right. Cancelled. So, um, what are your thoughts? Got any questions? Any thoughts about the assignment? Um, got any questions? Um, sorry, Simon. 
Yeah. Uh, looking at your uh, last week lecture, um, I think in the beginning you've you've highlighted you know some of the um, the uh, the artifact, the ancient uh, historical you know the the human activity in terms of drawings and, and yeah. Um, uh, is it okay for us to incorporate, you know, maybe um, the uh, early uh, from 17th to 16th century artists to uh, the, you know, the, the their artwork? It's kind of um, it reminds me of this the um, animation poses, especially you know the the Renaissance art for totally. instance. So if to incorporate that, maybe, you know, this is the assignment. One is the early stage of the, the, the this reassignment, so. Uh. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm slightly hesitant. I don't know, I don't know if I can express why. I yeah, I think yes. Um, um, because I, th I think it's important, the idea of, of sequential storytelling is important and it's relevant. Um, but I'd also like it to, to, you, know, to, to you to uh, get somewhere within the history of animation as such. But if you can tie it into... Um, not... The power of speech has eluded me today. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit apprehensive because I'm, I'm worried it might get a bit sort of off track. Okay, um, yeah, yeah. And, I'm, and I'll get, I guess the purpose of the, of the uh, assignment is to get you to investigate um, a, 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 an animate, a piece of animation or a piece of technology or the work of a, of a filmmaker. Okay. Um, and if it goes back pre um, filmmaking, then it it might miss the mark. But run it, run it past me. Run it, you know. Write, write me out a uh, a proposal. Okay. Uh, just a, a couple of you know, and I'll 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 see where you're going. It's the the re the reason being is in the past people have, have have gone off on a bit too much of a tangent and it, I was a bit sort of concerned that um, they were missing the point of the of the assignment and so I had someone want, wanted to write me a, an assignment about rock art um, <laughs> which is which is which is great it's fascinating stuff but is it animation I think there's a link I think it's storytelling, it's, it's, it's visual storytelling and there's sequential storytelling in there. And, um, but I think it might, it, there's a danger that it, you might miss the point and you might kind of get distracted and go off in too much of a tangent. But if you write me a proposal, just a quick, you know, couple of paragraphs and I'll, I'll think it through and we'll, we'll have a discussion about it. I don't. I don't want to sort of yeah. smash yeah. it. Go no, because the, you might you might have a really interesting point I hadn't considered. Yeah, no worries, thanks. Um, but yeah, I'm sort of interested to see what what things you might want to talk about. You know, there's there's lots of um, studios. Uh, there's lots of periods of animation that I think are, are fascinating culturally. Um, I think it's really important to, as I say, I alluded to, what was happening on a political, socio-economical, economic perspective. Um, so I think, you know, there's, it's interesting how in the 1920s, uh, there was a, a very, um, open kind of social code that was going on but then society suddenly kind of got quite puritanical um you know 
and things like bringing in prohibition and you know the the you know the the the, the great depression um uh and the Hayes code and there was all of these kind of other factors that kind of came in and and changed the content and changed the uh what people were doing and 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 the sort of the messaging they were having i think that's i think that's fascinating and and, and going back to watching some of those uh early films i think it's 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 interesting to to go back and watch this movie in particular which i think is one of the most important landmarks of this era of rubber hose animation for lots of reasons you know the cultural reference points i think cab calloway was a fascinating character the fact that um anim film animation uh was referencing you know cabaret acts like betty boop baby esther jones cab calloway all of these people were you know performers from the cotton club and it was it was really out there risky stuff um you know society had changed massively in the 1920s that like we'd never seen anything like it um it was a completely different era than the one before that went through the first world war the first world war changed everyone's sensibility and there's almost every era that we go through you can sort of see something it's like it's where art responds to uh society um and i find that fascinating i find i find you know i'm i'm kind of interested to know you know last week we had um those big demonstrations um around climate change and you know all i've heard through my media feed is is discussion around that how is that going to affect art and it's it's impossible to see it when you're in it because there's like an explosion i feel like we're in a mid, middle of a massive explosion in technology and um um and 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 society i think i think we're we're going to look back and and, the, and this is a really interesting period of time if we make it <laughs> i hope we do it's interesting like going from the 20s being so, sort of like debauched like you were saying and then um they introduced this like moralistic element like obviously somebody got self-conscious about it and was like okay we need to like reel it in and it's interesting, I feel like that censorship has just continued and mm -hmm. almost gotten like gradually tighter, like as yeah. time has gone on to the point now where artists feel stifled because they're criticized so easily about the most debatable things, you know. So that was really yeah. interesting to see that maybe that's kind of where that started. And I wonder what triggered um that censorship to begin with because the whole yeah. purpose of art um well one of the purposes of art is to for the artist to like vent you know how they're feeling and like express themselves um it makes sense of things yeah you know so it's weird that like i wonder what triggered you know everybody to agree that oh these are too you know um yeah N not tame they're too wild you know and we need to like reel it in well i think people were, were afraid i think there was they a society felt that um or there were people that thought people were out of control um and they they needed to you know um kind of rein it in a little bit because um i've been thinking about the 1920s quite a lot recently and it's a it's a debate I have with a few people about um, how how free and open people were creatively mm. in the nineteen twenties. And I'm not sort of saying oh you know moral standards and all of that, but I think we're incredibly uptight and prudish. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think we're really controlled. Mm. Um, 
which is curious. I mean, it's, you know, and we're really affected by that. I, um, yeah, I've, I've got a, I've got a few little sort of documentaries and insights into that period um, that I think inform that. Yeah. The other thing I thought was really interesting is how freely and easily people borrowed from each other creatively mm. that, um, you know, even the fact that Betty Boot was kind of uh, a hybrid character of a, of a singer and an actor and a cabaret performer. And that was just like, yeah, sure. You just borrow from, th and it was only later when, when they were making loads of money that those out, those artists went, hold on a bit. Can we have a bit of that money? Because hold on, you've borrowed from me from that. Mm. Um, and I don't know how successful they were. I suspect, um, oops, I'm going backwards here. I suspect uh, Baby Esther Jones had the least amount of agency in all of that. Mm. Um, one, that she was a cabaret artist, so sort of made less money, but also, you know, her ethnic background would have meant that was the case too, I guess. I don't know. I'm making some assumptions here. Mm. Um, but, you know, I read that there was a definitely a court case between Clara Bow and Fleischer and Helen Kane and Fleischer. Um, but, yeah, I suspect um, Esther Jones had less agency. I don't know. I'll be, I'll be curious to find out. I uh, mean, everybody gets inspiration from somewhere, though, right? Like... To think that they could, I don't know, I would have been surprised if they had any success. I, yeah, I just... yeah. And when you sort of think, I think about things of, of pure genius, like Cab Calloway. I just, I think he's, where did that come from? It's out of nowhere. You know, it's that sort of almost that, like, like that David Bowie genius. Mm. Um, and, you know, uh, it's kind of he was so influential. So he in, had this trademark kind of crazy dance, which the only way to animate it was to rotoscope it, and then you sort of see this rotoscoped version of him dancing, and you go, "Oh my god, that is just brilliant!" <laughs> and then just just weaving that narrative into this kind of crazy surreal story that makes no sense at all. Go back and watch, um, yeah. You know, St. James Infirmary Blues and uh, Minnie the Moocher. And you go, what? What is going on here? In fact, let's, let's, I think, I don't think I'm recording anymore. I think, I think I've paused. I think it is recording. I'm going to pause oh. the recording and then I'm going to play it because I don't want to have my video stopped. So I'm just going to pause.